Hello, YouTube. Welcome back to another episode of Comics and Stuff. This is our special segment, the Paper or Plastic Podcast, starring yours truly, myself, Devin, along with uh, my partner, Compost. And today we are going to be having uh, our another, the, the same guest as last episode, Nate, my friend, my DM, and also happen, who happens to be a lawyer. Uh, and we are going to be talking about the, the news that has popped up in the last... Uh, you know, week or so with, with Dungeons and Dragons, Wizards of the Coast, Paizo, and all that good stuff. So stay tuned. I'm going to bring everybody in, starting with Compost. Compost, my friend, welcome to the, uh, well, Compost has entered the chat. Hello, sir. Welcome. And bringing in Nate. Nate, my friend, how are you today? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Compost, how are you, sir? You're doing great, man. So it's a quick turnaround on the... I, I know. The Absolutely. Man. We we are totally not filming this last minute. No, not us, sir. No, <laughs> no, no. No. So, no. We didn't get blindsided by them changing literally everything two days after we filmed the no. last video. That didn't happen. No, We're not, totally not. on top of it. This is just a coincidence. We wanted to yeah. get together and talk about I, stuff. I didn't have, drop the ball and forget about. to schedule podcasting and then realize that Compost has drill and Nate has kids and <laughs> I'm a lazy fuck. But hey, hey, you know what? No, we didn't do no. This yeah, you all- said it on me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, internet. If you guys have, if you guys have been living under a rock, there has been a, a quite the shakeup in the uh, Magic: The Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons world slash communities slash sphere over the last like three months, um, and it all kind of came to a head with the Dungeons and Dragons fiasco that was the OGL 2.0 or 1.1a or whatever. How many you know how many drafts they said 1.1 and then 1.2 and now wherever the hell we are and then yeah and then 2.0 and then they were like never mind we're just leaving it as it is there's a whole (laughs) bunch of stuff yeah um so so i I suppose we 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 should probably just go over and if you're curious about the in-depth what happened uh that that's our last video which i will link to in, in the description below so you can actually go back and listen to nate uh skillfully explain everything um, but this is just going to be kind of like the aftermath of it. So uh, hopefully that this is a, a nice ride for you guys. Uh, and I feel like it should just we should just quickly go over what happened first. Does that mm. sound okay to you guys? Yeah. Yeah, like a timeline okay. maybe. Let's... I could yeah. I could do a timeline. I wrote one out. Yeah. Yeah. Hit, hit me with the timeline, Nate. Let's let's hear it. So um, the the full the full timeline. Um, you know, we we have this thing that's the open game license. The OGL uh, for Dungeons and Dragons, which what the OGL is, where again longer description in the previous video that Devin didn't think, but um, the OGL is essentially a license that allows you to use something called the SRD or the System Reference Document, um, and the SRD is essentially the core rules of Dungeons and Dragons. How what makes the game tick, right? And the OGL has been in place for twenty two years now, essentially from. The year 2000 ancient almost history. almost 23 years uh, um and we'll be 23 years this year and the um the, in january of this year in around january 4th of this year um the a, an update to the ogl leak um and a a, a journalist named the cadega they uh published an article that was a copy of the well published a article in an online publication discussing these leak changes and um, going over uh, going over the leaks and going over the information um, and discussing the changes from the OGL 1.0a to this new 1.1 OGL. And it was pretty dramatic. The changes were pretty significant. They had it contained a royalty provision where if you made over a certain dollar amount, you would have to pay royalties to wizards. They would they in, in another a number of other provisions like a license back provision that would cause the OG, essentially cause anyone who publishes under the OGL to license the third party content they create with that system resource document right. to wizards for free, and then wizards could republish their work without paying them. So there's a the community went up in arms. The, the whole Twitter sphere imploded. Uh, it had companies like Paizo and Kobold Press responding, who are major what major third party publication third party publishers, which were essentially who was being targeted by this. Wizards essentially said that they wanted this OGL 1.2 to control how 
um, you know, home brewers like myself could keep using the, the SRD, but big companies couldn't be making a profit off of it. But they want to right. uh, After the backlash, you know, and after our last conversation about the backlash, um, Wizards published uh, a, a comment version, draft version of the, what they called the OGL 1.2 which was a lot better, but not like 100% better. It was not irrevocable, though they said it was irrevocable. And basically, it, they could have revoked it through loopholes. It was not royalty-free. It, set, they, it didn't contain a provision for royalties. They didn't say it was royalty-free. Um, and then um, after that, uh, they put out a survey asking how we felt about it. The community overwhelmingly, I think it was like 90% of people who responded to the service that they didn't want to use it. Yeah. Um, so it was, they, like, it was just, like 89 to like 90%. Like, yeah. yeah was, so they just uh, capitulated and put the entire SRD into the Creative Commons under a Creative yeah. Commons 4.0 license, which we can talk about that more. So now. short version here is January 4th, the, the, the new OGL is leaked. January 5th onwards, everybody, everything's on fire. Everybody's angry. Everybody's screaming. And then yep. we get to, they make a half-assed apology and then everybody's still screaming. And then they make like a somewhat like, like they make an attempt to fix it. Everybody's still screaming. Then they have some random guy, Kyle, whatever, come up and be like, you hey guys, like on behalf of Watsy, I'm sorry. And then everybody's like, Poor what the Kyle. fuck is that? But like, okay. And then after that, they had, they actually put a Twitter thread out and they actually said, we are sorry. I've never heard of Wizards of the Coast actually saying, we're sorry. Uh, that yeah. was that was well, like, a, a, and, like a, a feat of just... And a thing yeah. to note, uh, a thing to note that was sort of, we sort of touched on in our last video, but I don't think we knew the impact yet. Um, the, the, big, uh, the big movement was hashtag D&D Be Gone. Which oh, was uh, or open D&D the, or whatever. Well, no, D D B Gone specifically was the movement to cancel your D D Beyond subscription. Yeah, or and that was stuff, so right? successful. Yeah, that was so successful because People the someone internally in Wizards leaked that the key metric they track, to see how the community feels, is D D Beyond subscriptions, and they lost so much money in D D Beyond subscription. Uh, they they. They lost so much money in DDB on subscriptions. People were so mad. And then that was a bit the big catalyst for them to actually apologize because the, you know, if you think about it logically, right, the, you know, Wizards obviously makes money off of book sales, right? They make money off of selling the source books. Right. But the bulk of their constant revenue stream is from a DD Beyond subscription. You subscribe to DD Beyond as a, I subscribe as a Dungeon Master because of additional tools. Um, and additional abilities to have multiple character sheets, you know, available and active in my D&D Beyond subscription. I can share my content with people who play in my campaign, so I I subscribed to D&D Beyond for that reason. But uh, and and the that's their key month to month, re, you know, month to month monetization model for D&D is the subscription model for D&D Beyond, right. and so they're not going to necessarily feel the impact of people not buying the source books right away. I mean, there's a source book coming out in like two weeks that they haven't PR, they haven't done any PR for at all. It's been totally silent. I think because of this controversy, they haven't rolled out a PR package because they just didn't want to, you know, run into the face of the community being so angry. I but like I think to, the key, you go ahead. I was going to say, I, I'd like to quickly read out what they actually, what they posted on the D&D Beyond website before I start looking for more tweets. Um, yeah, go ahead. If you guys don't mind, it's, it'll, this one's a quick read. So this is from Kyle Brink. That was the name. So, when you give exactly us play test, yeah. So when you give us play test feedback, we take it seriously. Already, more than fifteen thousand of you have filled out the survey. The survey referencing the one that they released about how people feel. Uh, so here's what you said: you being the community, eighty-eight percent do not want to publish TTRPG content under OGL one point two. Ninety percent would have to change some aspect of their business to accommodate OGL one point two. 89% are dissatisfied with deauthorizing the OGL 1.0a. 86% are dissatisfied with the v, uh, the draft VTT policy. For those of you who don't know, VTT is virtual tabletop. Uh, and 62% are satisfied with including the systems reference document, or the SRD, content in Creative Commons. And the majority of those who are dissatisfied asked for more SRD content in Creative Commons. These live surveys are clear. You want OGL 1.0a. 
you want irrevocability, you like Creative Commons. The feedback is in such high volume and its direction is so plain that we're acting now. One, we are leaving OGL 1.0a in place as is untouched. Two, we are making the entire SRD 5.1 available under a Creative Commons license. Three, you choose what you prefer to use. I do I do have some curi or some questions about that, Nate. I'm not sure what that means by you pr choose which we prefer to use. But anyhow, uh, this Creative Commons license makes the content freely available for any use. We don't control that license and cannot alter or revoke it. It's open and irrevocable in a way that doesn't require you to take our word for it. I'm also curious about that. Uh, and its openness means that there's no need for a VTT policy. Placing the SRD under Creative Commons license is a one-way door. There's no going back. Our goal here is to deliver what you wanted. So what about the goals that drove us when we started this process? We wanted to protect the D&D play experience into the future. We still want to do that with your help. We're grateful that this community is passionate and active because we'll uh, need your help protecting the game's inclusive and welcoming nature. You'll want to limit, uh, we wanted to limit the OGL to TTRPGs with this new approach. We are setting that aside and counting on your choices to define the future of play. Here's a PDF, there's a PDF link. Uh, then they say, we're, we're closing the OGL 1.2 survey now. We'll keep talking with you about how we can better support players and creative or uh, and creators. Thanks as all for continuing to share your thoughts, Kyle Brink. So the first thing that I'm curious about while I am searching for more tweets, what what does it mean? Uh, well, first, let, let's talk about what is what is a Creative Commons license? What is that? What is Creative Commons? So Creative Commons is a 501c3 nonprofit company um, in the United States, and it's a multinational okay. corporation. It, it's then it's you know it, it extends beyond just the United States. It covers um, people in multiple countries. Um, and essentially, what they do is they publish the Creative Commons licenses, version 4.0. Uh, they were founded in 2001 as this idea of uh, some call it the copy left movement, in, in contrast to the copyright movement um, and and the copyright law, laws and copyright concepts. And the idea is to have an open uh, sort of an open media, um, open, uh, you know, the, what the, I mean, their, their slogan or their, their, their splash line on their website is help us build a vibrant collaborative global commons. So the idea of the creative commons is they want creative people to come together and share their work. And the key point about the creative commons licenses is that you're allowed to use anything under a creative commons license essentially for free um without pay we don't uh, literally for free it's a no it's a non um it's a it's a non um uh there's a royalty free license was right. the words so, i was looking for, for uh, but for, the like in, in layman's terms it's basically they they took their so watsi took their little license thing gave it to the this company and said here you can have this publish it for everybody now it's not ours anymore well, no, Basically. actually, no. Uh, no. So, Creative Commons does never own anything, right? They don't own the content. The Creative Commons itself does not uh, take ownership of the thing that's being licensed. Uh, they have the the anybody is free to use the Creative Commons license, and essentially, the it's one license that you can just adopt the terms of by saying we're using the Creative Commons license. Um, and all it means is that anyone who wants to use your work has to abide by the terms of the Creative Commons license in order to do that. And the key thing, the key consideration for the Creative Commons license is that the person using the content has to attribute it to the correct content uh, licensor, um, who is the licensor is the person who owns the content. So in, in the case of the SRD, the, the system reference document, uh, Wizards of the Coast is the, is the licensor. But Creative Commons okay. is not a licensor, and they are not actually a party to the license. They just publish it. They make it available to anybody who wants to use it, and they also often litigate and try to protect the license from people who would attack it or try to um, circumvent it. Um, they they do what they can to keep the commons you know, open and and in the spirit of you know, exchange and the spirit of you know, the free exchange of ideas. Um, but no, the Wizards didn't give the, the Creative Commons company any ownership of. Oh, okay, dragons okay. Or, or anything like that um they just said okay you you are now able to access this under an irrevocable creative commons license so in a sense they've given away they've, they've basically just made the core of fifth edition uh because when you when you publish something under a creative commons license it, that's irrevocable you can't take it back you can't just say okay i'm gonna i'm gonna revoke this license 
one of the key uh, you know the key aspects of the creative commons license oh um, you're coming in and i didn't catch that uh, last sentence i believe one of the one of the core pieces of the creative commons is your irrevocability uh, i haven't read the full license you know because it's a legal license um but uh the the whole idea is that you when you put something into the creative license uh creative common license you're essentially making it making it open and free um and that you you must um uh the the key obligation for the person the licensee the person who's using the content is they have to attribute so if you if you're going to use dnd content under the 4.0 license you have to say i'm using this content uh under the under the creative commons 4.0 license um and the the srd actually the new srd um uh actually gives the language they want you to use there's a whole par- there's a paragraph where the ogl used to be the like the two page original ogl in the srd there's now just a one page it looks like a quarter of a page thing with a one paragraph attribution that you must put into your so before, if you were to use the OGL 1.0a, you had to include the entire text of the OGL in your work when you were publishing. Mm-hmm. You have to put it in your work somewhere to show that it's that it's you're under the OGL, and your work is also under the OGL. This all you have to do is attribute. You don't have to put you don't have to put the for the 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 Creative Commons 4.0 license in there. You just have to attribute wizards with this specific attribution paragraph, um, and that's all you have to do. Um, but no, they, so they didn't. They didn't give it. They didn't give away ownership. They still own the intellectual property. They can still take people to court for for doing things that are outside of the license, um, mm-hmm. that are not contemplated by the license, um, or people who don't attribute correctly. Um, but you know, they're they're not in. They're not. Um, they're. It's it's a kind of a fine. It's a fine distinction, right? Because. They don't. The Creative Commons doesn't own any of this, any of these, you know, licensing or anything like that. But when they put it into a Creative Commons license, they lose a lot. Well, there's kind of an argument if they ever actually still had this because of the way the OGL worked. Because the OGL functioned similar to a Creative Commons license. The OGL is just older than the Creative Commons. The Creative Commons license didn't exist when they built the OGL. So. Um, the, the OGL and the Creative Commons kind of do the same thing. Uh, so it's kind of like the Wizards do anything. But, you know, let's say for a minute that the OGL never existed and Wizards is putting this into the Creative Commons for the first time, making it publicly licensed for free. It, it's kind of like they've given up some element of ownership, right? Because when, uh, when like, the Tolkien estate, right? If someone tries to, you know, make a derivative derivative work based on some of the J.R.R. Tolkien's work, Tolkien estate holds the copyright to Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, to the Silmarillion, those things that were published by oh, JR. You're coming in and out again. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm I have no idea. I just, just talking. <laughs> um, is it better now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in, in <clears throat> contrast to the um, the the way the OGL worked, right? The Tolkien estate owns the copyright to all of Tolkien's work, and the Creative Commons, it, like, like if. if uh, if, if someone were to publish like a uh, a copyright infringing work, a derivative work, like someone, if someone say someone made a fan movie and wanted to sell it on on some kind of a platform, right? Mm-hmm. It was it was a, essentially a fan reproduction of a Lord of the Rings movie with Legos. They're trying to sell that. The Tolkien estate could sue them for copyright infringement for making a derivative or making a non authorized derivative work. But and 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 so for instance, if if D and if D and D hadn't been under the OGL before, and they had it, and they had retained all the copyright protections, they could have done the same thing. They could have sued somebody mm-hmm. for making a derivative work. The um, the and they still kind of can because of the way it's carved out. It's kind of complicated in terms of what's carved in and out. But now they've kind of they've given away to the Creative Commons license. They've by putting their work into a Creative Commons license, they've given up some of their ability to sue people for using it so long as they okay Um, and so now in their in their release here they say you choose what you prefer to use so is that saying you can choose to either use this creative commons license or Mm -hmm. the ogl 1.0a which they're keeping in place is that essentially what they're saying yep exactly because the one of the things that the community never agreed with them on and we still don't agree with them 
is that the is the the revocability of the OG. <clears throat> um the it, it, the community and it, it, you read it in Paizo's statement everybody when it was put in place believed it was irrevocable the intent was believed to be irrevocable um there's nothing in the document that says it can be revoked so it's the community's opinion that the OGL 1.0a can't be revoked. um right. irrevocable. and so Stay right. so that's what it was meant to do and that was a big point of contention here because throughout all of their responses up until the last one they were steamrolling forward on, no, we're going to revoke this and we have the power to do that. And the the big capitulation for them is that they've left it up. So you can either use the OGL 1.0a or you can use the Creative Commons. You can mm-hmm. decide which one you like better. And they're yeah. they're different. I mean, the, o, the Creative Commons 4.0 has been, Creative Commons license has been updated continuously throughout uh, the years. It was The original license was published in 2001 when the Creative Commons um exist first started you know being a, a registered entity um and it's well, being updated with the times question. and how and how um you know intellectual property law has changed over the years but the the right. idea behind that license is the same so yeah, they even uh like even like the addition of like a uh, fair use like i think that was, right. that was like a really mm-hmm. big it's still a big thing like for creators right um, yeah um, yeah and and we have a whole like Co- the copyright landscape of 2023 is so different than the copyright landscape of 2001. I mean, in regards to written publications, it might not be that different, but we have like Twitch streams with music and we have so many things now that they didn't even contemplate back in 2000. 2000 right. Mm-hmm. I don't think anybody contemplated critical role uh, when they were creating the, o- no. the OGL, right? Nobody contemplated, uh, you know, a, a bunch of, people live streaming a game and creating derivative content based on that live stream and what that would how that would affect you know the copyrights of right. the owners of Dungeons and Dragons because all they were really thinking about at the time was hey if we put this open license out there people will produce adventure paths for us so we don't have to expend the money to produce adventure paths between publications and we could focus on the things that actually make us money right, right. and that's why i feel really? like definitely um sorry just like even- like I understood where they were coming at with like the, you know like the web um you know, like web 3 and and you know mm-hmm. um, yeah uh cuz just getting ahead of that um but yeah that kind of shot themselves in the foot and the, the approach that they took you know yeah, but, um, right right the very aggressive approach yeah really quickly i i would like to apologize to the entire internet who just heard my neck crack um cuz i just cracked the baby jesus out of my neck and i know that yeah. that was directly in the microphone it was very yeah. gross. I apologize. Um, <laughs> but uh, also, uh, I found that tweet, and I'm going to screenshot the fuck out of it. Thank you for your continued dedication and love for Dungeons & Dragons. We are sorry for the pain we've caused to the community. That's right. We look forward to building what comes next with our players and creators. Screenshot. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I... I'm very, I, I, I'm very curious, and I, maybe this is something that me as just like a, a pleb, just I just don't understand as as a simple working man. Um, I understand that that business can be very cutthroat, and I understand right. that you know businesses, it's all about making money. So like I, I'm not going to be mad at a business for trying to do specifically what businesses are supposed to do, which is generate revenue. What I what I'm still having a very and this is in relation to what what you just said, Campos. I'm, I'm having a really hard time understanding the the people at the top, or as as Rudy says, you know, in, in at the top of the ivory tower with your with you know your ex girlfriend and a bunch of Taco Bell. What are these people, Chris Cox and and uh, what's her face, Miss Williams, who reads the definition of magic off of the Wikipedia page? I want to know what it was that they were thinking when this was like typed up and and like really and i mean like it it was not like a slight i mean this was an overhaul to to right. something that is that has been standing for, i i want to know what is going on up here for think, these business type people who like i get you're trying to make money but like you're not stupid you got you got to your yeah. position by right. being good at what you do this seems like just such an asinine, just bad decision to both, both for goodwill for the magic community and the D and D community for MTG 30 and the OG. Right. What 
is going right. on up here. Well, what you know, that's what I want to know. I I think there's a lot of 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 conflating factors, right? I mean, right. from this angle, you've got business, and you know, obviously, the thing that's kind of unspoken here is that everybody who's involved, if we weren't invested in this, if we if we didn't want this company to keep going, we wouldn't care. Right? Like if we didn't care if they crash and burned, we wouldn't be as mad as we are. But we love these hobbies. We love these games. We want them to keep going. And so one motivation from the business is something that we're sometimes aligned with, which is they want to keep continuing as a business. They don't want to go out of business. But right. that's also, there's also greed, right? Like there's a there's an angle of, in capitalism, when you have any big company, it's not just how do I keep surviving? It's how do I keep increasing my profits? How do I keep amplifying and increasing and pushing the boundary on okay i made 10 billion dollars last year how can i make 11 billion dollars next year I made 11 billion dollars last year how can i make 25 billion dollars next year it's like the they there's the this steady march of what we did last year not good enough anymore what we do what we do what we do this year has to be better than last year what we do next year has to be better than this year because we must continue to grow and consume and that's i think once well, that's, that's antithetical to how we, you know, yeah. Well, the other, I think the yeah. other factor too is that a lot of the behind the scenes people don't necessarily understand the way people want to engage with the hobby. They, they, they are looking at ways that they can capitalize on our money as investors and as people who are invested in the hobby. They're not necessarily looking at it the, at the best way to deliver what we want. They're looking at the best way to get separate us from our money, right? right. That's the business and the the capital aspect of of this whole conversation. And I know that there was a lot of commentary about the guy who's in charge of the, the web development for both MTG arena mm -hmm. and for um, DD beyond and the project castle, I think the, um, the, the DDVTT, the, um, the, mm -hmm. the wizard's owned virtual tabletop that's supposed to have like animatics and animation and a bunch of other stuff. That's the thing that they're rumored to be looking at a $30 a month model. Um, is right. this the idea of a, a virtual tabletop that's really has a lot of like video game style features um, that you'll be able to use in your in your home games? Um, and these guys are looking at ways that you know, obviously the the, the executives at Wizards have said that D and D is under monetized and they want to they they they're not making enough money off of what they believe to be a valuable IP, which is fine. And right. a lot of the theories that I've been listening to in terms of the community on what's actually happening. Um, in this space is that in, in OGL 1.1 and 1.2, you can see them building the walls around D&D. They're building a walled garden. And in this context, what that means is they're trying to make D&D an isolated system where only the people they want to be in could come in and the people they want to stay out have to pay for entry, right? Mm -hmm. They said this pretty much explicitly in the first statement that Kyle Brink made where they were saying that they wanted to keep out, you know, um, objectionable content, content that's harmful or hurtful. They also said they wanted to keep out big companies from profiting off of DD, which is what not what they thought the 1.0a was intended to be. So they've said that, you know, we don't want Disney to be able to make free DD content. Right. You, know, you know, this makes me this makes me wonder. I wonder what things would have been like if they had just done this from the get go kind of like Disney and the Tolkien estate. No, this is our stuff. These are our characters. That's how it is. Like, I, I, wonder... it wouldn't, I don't think it would have grown as much as it, it, as where the, it is there's, now. Yeah. There's no way that the hobby would be as big as, as it is. Mm -hmm. I think third-party publishers are r responsible for a huge element of D&D success because, mm -hmm. I mean, Paizo, they started as the advent, you know, they, they published Pathfinder, which was a magazine that uh, pro provided adventure paths, right? And for D right. for Dungeons and Dragons third and third three five editions, and then a bunch of people on that Pathfinder team decided to publish Pathfinder first edition because of all the implosion at Wizards and 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 Dungeons and Dragons fourth edition, which was a failure, and that's where Paizo comes from. Paizo could not have done that without the OGL one point it, it wouldn't have happened, and. And the, it, it, you know, Wizards and D&D &D would not be where they are today if if they, ha if they hadn't done the OGL 1.0A. I, I, I don't believe that they would be, that the hobby would be nearly anywhere where it is now. 
Right. Circling back really quickly to like what they were probably thinking, I think there's a lot of overlap, just like in Hasbro and Wizard of the Coast, like because like the communities between like Magic and D and D, like I feel like the the D and D community definitely voted with their wallets, you know, like like yeah. and that's that's what definitely changed the tides, you know, like. Well, and it's it's I funny. Like, I was... Oh, you go, 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 go. Sorry, I just talk. Go, 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 go. <laughs> but yeah, no, I was uh, I, like, if if that if that same type of um, like uproar like if that voting with your wallet was done on this on like within the magic community i feel like we could get possibly the same results but it's not going to happen because bingo people like uh, invest you know like right and i think, and I think that's that last a, time, but. yeah i think it's a big key key factor here right the the with the dnd community pretty much universally hated this choice but i don't think anybody in the mtg community universally does anything right i yeah. think there's a lot of things that are unpopular in the wizards in the you know in the in the magic community and i think that if there's a project that's if there's a product that's an actual flop wizards will see the impact of that right like if there's a product that is actually bad we'll let them know i mean i think the sales numbers will reflect will reflect on that but the the i think the compost is right that the problem is that there are people who invest in magic there are people who, who buy magic as an investment and those whales those kinds of people who are buying magic because they want the shiny and they don't really care about the gameplay or the gameplay is secondary to the investment. They're going to keep buying the stuff, driving yeah, it forward. Nice. Yeah. I think you also have the, the idea that there's also sealed format in, in magic you have draft, right? Which mm -hmm. I, draft is a community drive. It's not like the biggest driver in magic because that's commander, but draft is a big driver for, for like just product sales. And you might have a product that commander players hate that is great for draft players. And they love, they love drafting. So like magic is such an intersectional community that they can probably make money off of things that aren't popular with group A or group B. Whereas D and D, there's one product. It's Dungeons mm -hmm. and Dragons. It's one game. Yeah. It's Dungeons and Dragons. You're and whereas magic is really like 45 different games in one ecosystem, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, there's a core rule set and they're publishing additional stuff for the core rule set. But the key driving factor was paying into D and D beyond. If you're like, well, you're doing something I don't like, I'm going to remove my subscription. There's no really easy subscription model that they can track that with with Magic the Gathering, right? Yeah. And yeah, I think maybe if there them. was, like, maybe if there was a subscription model for Dean for for MTG, maybe that would there would like been similar backlash from the MTG thirty situation, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe the MTG thirty situation would have caused people to unsubscribe from Magic. But again, I think that their sales numbers would suffer because. In terms of paper magic, which is where they make a lot of their money, people are still going to buy that. It's just going to happen. Yeah, right. It's it's an interesting thing. Um, kind of like what they're. A lot of people were really angry about this. There was a uh, like a live stream where one of the sales exec guys said, you know, because uh, somebody somebody mentioned how there's a lot of product fatigue because they're releasing stuff yeah. so fast that people can't oh. keep up and. Yeah the guy who was doing the live stream i was uh, i cannot remember who he was for some reason um but his uh, response essentially was don't partake in products that aren't for you yeah basically. some of these products are not for you yeah if you don't like that, so, i think that was a response to, like double masters right double masters 2022 uh, yeah i think i think it was and and because... i think that like it like a lot of people were like, oh, like this is so shitty of Watsy, you know, like it's all Papa Hasbro greed, blah blah blah. Um, but it makes it makes sense because, whereas like you said, Nate, D and D, there's just D and D, right? Like, uh, but uh, when it comes to Magic, I mean, you're right. You have Commander, Standard, Modern, Popper, uh, and several other formats that i'm sure i'm oh legacy historic brawl uh you know then you have mtg arena draft, draft. Yeah, yeah like there's so commander many draft. different formats and commander draft there's so many different formats and commander yes is the the most popular bit uh, or part of of magic right now but like that doesn't mean that people don't play the other i mean i i fucking love popper i've gotten I'm so it. into it yeah like I, I just built my fourth deck uh, for for like Popper uh, Commander, Popper Commander, which is great. It's really fun. Um, Nate, build your deck. Um, but uh, you know, it's it is it's yeah. such a big thing that that like yeah. I mean, 
people hated MTG 30. They ended the sale after 39 minutes. Okay. You know, some people loved the Warhammer 40k decks and they have proven to be a financial success. Some people hated it. Well, it's, yeah, it's I mean, a little I, different. I think, I, I think the the worst thing for Magic right now is the glut of product, right? That's what was from yeah. the Bank of America thing, right? Like, yeah. and that was the the glut of product is is potentially hurting the long term value of the game. But again, the long term value of the collectible is a speculative value to Wizards, right? And the I I think one of the things that they're trying to do by bombing the market with product is get more players involved in the game. Which is something that I think we can enjoy, but I think they've been going about it in a weird way, right? Like, mm-hmm. I think I think the the Warhammer 40k decks are a perfect example of that, right? They're approaching a new market. Warhammer 40k players are not necessarily Magic players, right? I'm a Warhammer player. I'm also a Magic player, but I play with a lot of Warhammer players who are not Magic players, right? And this was a way for Warhammer players to say, "Hey, I like Necrons, or I like Chaos, or I like the Space Marines. I want to buy that deck." and see what that's about and play with my friends. And they did such a genius thing by putting out five decks, right? Like they put out, it was five, right? They put out five decks. To make four, it playable. I think. I think it was four. Four? I think it was four. I think. Don't quote Necrons, me Necrons, Tyranids, Space Marines, Chaos. I put out only four. They put out a full pod, right? I think it was four, you yeah. Could, you, could, you could get a full pod of Commander from people who had never played the game before. With the inserts in the thing and everything that's ready to go, they can they can play the game and get into magic. The new commander decks, right? The commander decks targeted new players that came out at the end of last year. Great product for expanding the horizons, right? Jumpstart, great way to introduce people to the game. So they're doing good products that are not necessarily targeted at us who are veteran players, right? The new commander decks, I'm not buying them. Jumpstart, yeah, I might buy Jumpstart, position. but it's not a necessary product for me. And and uh, the idea that the, the market is flooded is a is a problem right like it's a it's a problem for the long term value of the game and they should really cool it because eight sets plus I mean a, a product being released every month is just really that's it's, it's a lot right like it, it makes <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, I think that's the one thing where they're yeah it's it's it is the one thing that they are screwing up on it, it is is just they're they're yeah. inundating the market and. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, I guess there there will always be people who say, "Well, I don't care how many times they print a card; I just want to play the game, and it will be infinitely fun." And that's like that's great, you know. Like I yeah. I, I never want the game to die because I I am invested in it, but I also am you know a hardcore player of it. And and I think that my biggest worry is is not even necessarily the the overprinting. I think that it's Wizards of the Coast has been doing things in such a way that they are just sowing really bad like uh just um bad blood with the community it's it's they're just like they're yeah they're not being cool they're not playing nice they're doing the thing and sometimes yeah. we love it sometimes we hate it but like it's just they're they're creating a lot of bad will for themselves and it's like they're you guys could make your money and still be beloved by the community you don't have to be assholes but they're doing a lot of assholeish things yeah that's just my right. I, mean, I feel like it's definitely the status quo if you look at it i mean just on companies nowadays like just to get well, to a certain point like... like you have your amazons and your apples and whatnot where it's like you really so everything's a cash grab now you know like well and, and it's not like wizards hasn't had controversies with the community of magic since the beginning of magic right like right. there's been a very contentious relationship between the player community and the end of for years and it's not like it's ever going to be different and i think that's part of the problem too is that they might just be jaded to community feedback for magic specifically because of how volatile the the player base can be one thing is really upsetting to commander players standard players don't give a shit because they're playing standard right or you have one thing that's really really aggravating to standard players that doesn't really bother commander players all that much because they're playing commander and they don't really care about what's in standard legal and what's doing that going that direction like Meat Hook Massacre, right? Huge problem for Standard. It's a staple in Commander. And it's there are more available things like Meat Hook, like Toxic Deluge, it's not Standard. Level, that Commander players, we have ways to deal with it that are outside of Standard. But in a limited format like Standard, things like Meat Hook can be super format warping and need to be banned, right? So it doesn't really affect us in Commander that much. 
against Standard, it's a huge warping thing. And you have those fans lashing at Wizards about that. And then Commander players are lashing at Wizards for, you know, that thing. And, the, and then collectors are coming back and saying, oh, you reprinted Mystic Remora and you drove down the value of my collectible. Ah. And it just comes back of like the, that so many talking heads, so many head, talking heads having different opinions, right? And they're all valid opinions, but what, okay, if Wizard stops reprinting Mystic Remora, Commander players are going to be mad because they can't get a Mystic Remora for less than $50. And right. then if, and then if they, if they don't, Ban Meat Hook in standard. Standard players are gonna be mad because Meat Hook is more right. So they they have to find a way to play this symphony where they're trying to appease everyone. And at the end of the day, everyone knows, especially anyone who has kids knows, you can't make everybody happy all the time. It's not gonna happen. You're not yeah. gonna, you know, yeah. it's not gonna work. That makes good sense. I think I think the other thing that I, I hear a lot of people angry about, and this surprisingly doesn't bother me so much. But the, the consistent variations of like alt arts for different cards, um, a lot of people are saying, you know, I, I don't want 15 variants or, te- you know, whatever of a, of a fucking card. I, I know that Elish Norn has what, like five or six variants in this upcoming um, All Will Be One. Yeah. And I, I can understand that people get like frustrated or angry or mad about it. But like it's the, it's not a new concept to have alt art cards. And it, it doesn't, and, and just because they print more than one doesn't make it any less. I mean, look at Pokemon. Pokemon has been doing it for years and it's yeah. still so wildly uh, successful. There's that Umbreon card, the Umbreon card that right. has like a thousand, it's an Umbreon VMAX full art, whatever. It's like a thousand dollar card or like $800 card, but it has like three or four other variants of the same card. There's just, there's, there's VMAX alt, there's regular VMAX, there's V full art, regular V. Like it, it's the it's still the same Pokemon just with different alt like art forms, and it's it's the fan favorite one that ends up ten tends you know to be the the expensive one, um, and I think that Magic is kind of headed for that direction, and I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. And this might be a hot take, I don't know, um, but I I'm not so much a proponent of like alt arts, uh, but I know that some people just really hate it because it right. makes it less special because there only used to be so few alt arts or whatever have you. Um, I, I just, I don't see it as the worst. I don't think it's a bad thing. thing. Right. I, I don't, I, mean, I don't think it's a bad thing for the hobby. I don't think it's a bad, I am bad thing for the game. For the GEO. Yeah. You are Norn. stoked for Elish Norn. You built that absolutely heinous Elish Norn deck that mm-hmm. is going to make everyone. It. It, it's, it is disrespectful. I mean, the deck you made is just, I think it's you a, know, that. you know what it's you a did. Very, it is a, it, I know, <laughs> you know what you did. I know what I did. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think to circle back to the to the issue at hand of where we left off, I think one of the interesting points that keeps coming up in regards to the open game license and the, it being put into the um, Creative Commons is what actually happened, right? I mean, we're all we're all claiming victory, which is I think I think we we've earned a pat on the back as a community because we prevented them from doing the bad thing. We're trying to do the bad thing. No one had to sue anybody, right? That was great. I was I was fully expecting someone to get sued. Um, but I think I was, that... I had my popcorn ready. Yeah, right? Yeah, like in this corner, Paizo, in this corner. <laughs> um, but the nobody had to get sued, and Wizards backed down, and they apologized, which is crazy, because they never, they never do that. Um, but the the... All the legal analysis I've been looking into. Again, this is a legal analysis hat, so not legal advice. I'm not your lawyer. Uh, but the the interesting thing is is that both the OGL and now the Creative Commons 4.0 in regards to the SRD, they're not actually protecting much, because as we did, touched on the last episode, the the rules of a game are not copyrightable. They're not copy protected. You can't protect the, your rights to the rules of a game. If you publish a rule, a, well, a publisher rule book of, of game rules, so long as a person does not copy and paste those rules directly, they're probably not violating copyright. And, it, and if you are just publishing a document that is only rules, they may be able to copy and paste that entirely because if it's only game rules, there may not actually be any you know, unique expressions in there that are copyrightable. Um, and copywriting isn't granular. You can't, if I took the text of a spell, for instance, 
from the SRD, and I didn't attribute it to anybody, and I published it somewhere, but I changed, you know, it changed a little bit of it, or didn't even change anything. I just published the spell. It's a spell. If it's just a functional rule description of the spell, then there there may not actually be any copyright infringement because rules can't be copyrighted, right? Right. I got into a thing on Twitter, uh, an engagement on Twitter, where someone was saying, "Well, it, you know." Rules aren't copyrightable, but expressions of rules are copyrightable. And the example they used was, you know, you can copyright the expression "roll one," you know, uh, make a Constitution saving throw or take one d8 fire damage. But that that phrase that they used is entirely an expression of rules. That right. phrase is not, I believe, copyrightable. You can't copyright the idea of rolling a d8 for fire damage. You can't copyright the idea of a Constitution saving throw. Because multiple games, not just D and D, have Constitution as a statistic and saving throw, and you can't copyright the concept of Constitution being core to a character's existence, right? Because human Constitution is a concept that's been debated for thousands of years. So you can't just take those concepts and make them copyrightable concepts. So the 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 thing that Legal Eagle said, and the thing that that I think is is worth noting, is that the OGL 1.0 allowed you to use Wizards IP in the SRD without what was Wizards reporting as their IP in the SRD without fear of reprisals from the company. But it's not clear that that was ever actually necessary because the SRD is essentially the player's handbook, but stripped down to bare bones, right? It's very clear if you were trying to copy from the player's handbook, that's not, that's a no, no because the player's handbook has a lot in there. That's not just mechanics. There's a lot of fluff and flavor and descriptors and, but the SRD is right. just mechanics, just and, and that that fluff and flavor is unique to D and D, and that's the stuff you can copyright. Like like you said last time, you can't copyright things like the idea of orcs or elves or dwarves, right. but certainly they can take the copyright on like an owl bear or like a or displacer beast, Faerun, right, right, or the plane of Faerun, or right. or the the like a named dragon character, right, or right. Xanathar, like right. Xanathar, even some like. The, like a beholder, right? One of the core monsters of D&D. Those are all things that are both trademarked and copyrighted in terms of different the different aspects of character, right? Like stories about characters. Like Drizzt Dowerden is a copyright. Drizzt as a character is, he's a copyrighted character. And, right. and, and the images of beholders are trademarked. Um, the D&D logo is trademarked. So those kinds of things, obviously you can't use that. That's protectable. And that's never been licensed under any of these agreements. Right. Right. And that's never um, really been part of the question. Right. right. It's never been part of the question. And it's kind of this, this, the, the, the idea that, you know, they've capitulated by giving the SRD into creative commons. You know, yes, we, we should be glad that they've stopped trying to revoke the OGL. That's the real victory. They're not trying to revoke the OGL. Them putting the OGL, putting the the SRD into the Creative Commons, is not as big of a victory because essentially it's not clear that that, that the SRD is actually protectable. The, the rights to the SRDs are actually protectable under copyright. The real question is going to come out to what's going to happen next, right? Well, because that's, that's one my next question for you. Yeah. So <laughs> go, go go for it. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean. What is going to happen next? Because Paizo, I don't know if you've if you've been keeping up, but Paizo released a thing, and they're like they're still moving forward with Project Black Flag, which is their whole their own OG, uh, you know, form of an OGL. So, like, I, I want to know. It, it seems like Wizards of the Coast has has begun uh, inadvertently. I think I don't think they meant to do it. I think that they were just thinking everybody would fall in line, but they have begun some form of split, and now a new precedent is potentially going to be set, and now there's going to be a new system being formed or like kind of something kind of similar to like a creative commons being formed where all of these different games and, and ways to play a game can be published under a different type of license. I wonder if this, their, their assholery of the way they handled this and the bad will they saw in the community is going to ultimately lead to more people using this new system and D and D losing a lot of revenue. What are your thoughts? Speculate with me. The, I don't know if, if you revenue is going to enter into it. I mean, so yeah. the what I can see happening, right? Uh, obviously, Paizo has Paizo is a, I think a big voice in the community here, and Paizo is essentially saying, you know, great, you stopped doing it, but we're not going to trust you're not going to try to do it again later. 
So we're gonna um, we're gonna build our own system where it's not going to be in the hands of a company that we don't trust, right? And and I think that's the key thing is that Wizards has lost a lot of the trust for the community in regards to this. Like the the OGL was the gold standard for the community for three years, and it still exists. But it, yeah, the trust behind it has been tarnished. Right, the goodwill towards the company and the idea that it's irrevocable has been now quest called into question, and it's clear they've they've showed their hand right by saying, "Oh, we think it's revocable." Okay, well, you think it's revocable. We don't think it's revocable. We can't trust you now, right? Because it, if if it's in another business context, right? Like, let's say you're like, "Okay, I'm going to buy fifty thousand widgets from your company for this amount of money, and this contract, we're going to totally agree on it." And then halfway through buy, paying for this stuff, they're like, well, we think you can give us money without actually getting this thing from us in the future. We think we can just cancel this unilaterally after we've only given you 25% of what you part, 30%. Right? That's like a really stark, well, I, I, that's not how I viewed this contract that we executed. I'm worried now that we're going to have a disagreement. So you might be more cautious in doing business dealings with the person on the other side of that table. Which I think is going to be a, what the community does moving forward. I think the community is going to be a little bit more cautious moving forward with wizards and building third-party content. And I think that the orc may be a safe haven for the community because it's going to be they want it to be like the Linux Foundation. They want it to be controlled by a third party. It's not interested in the, the what what system use or anything like that. Not interested in selling the games. They're going to safeguard the license, which is want is the the, the orc licensed system agnostic uh, a way that right. you publish your content that's safe from any company just coming in and saying no we need more money right and the um the the other thing that i see happening right is i see that this i think that this now means right with it with the the ogl being in place still and the um the srd being in the creative commons it functionally means that they're not going to try to revoke it for fifth edition right the fifth edition content will be will be safe making fifth edition content will be safe moving forward i think the concern is okay but they're we know that they're building the, the, the sixth edition right we know that yeah, they're the building one the next D&D edition. or whatever yeah. right so there's going to be a new srd for that and they don't have to publish it under the old ogl they don't have to put it into the Creative Commons. They can do OGL 1.2 for this new SRD and build their walled garden for D&D. And there's nothing we do to stop them from doing that because that's content they own that they haven't licensed yet. And they're not required to put that new content under the old license. So the concern is, okay, they're going to double down on it when they publish this new edition. And then is the community going to stick with, with D&D, right? Or... Is the community going to call their bluff and make content for D&D without the authorization of a new restrictive OGL and face wizards lashing out? And then we'll see our litigation. Because I envision a couple of scenarios, and one of them is, okay, a pub- someone like me, right? I publish content for Dungeons & Dragons. I'm considering shifting to, play- to to Pathfinder because of all this. I'm considering moving my business to Pathfinder. I think a lot of people are considering moving their business to Pathfinder and buying Pathfinder products Rather than Matt, rather than Wizards products, which that could be a huge thing for them that they won't see the fallout of until one D they try to start throwing out a new wave of books that there may not be a market for. I think that might be something that they they may not be able to track reliably because of this. That's a that's an open question, right? But mm-hmm. let, let's say that I did stick with D because I like D. Let's say I do want to adapt to one D and D, whatever it is out, but I don't want to take the I, I want to make my own setting and I want to make my own classes. I don't want to use any of the stuff in the answer. I think that a person like me could publish, potentially publish content without using the SRD for whatever sixth edition and potentially not actually face any repercussions. If we're only using the mechanical aspects of the game and not using any copyrightable content, the fluff. I think that's where the litigation may be. And again, right now it seems like it's been staved off because they capitulated on fifth edition, which is wildly popular and played by millions of people worldwide. 
But what's going to happen when they put out this new edition? Are they going to try to double down and be sneaky about it and be like, well, we're going to publish this under OGL 3.1 or whatever, and they're going to say, well, this is a totally new thing and you have to do all these revenue provisions, et cetera, et cetera. I think it would be a bad move if they did that, but I could see them being, like, if their objective is to build a walled garden around d if their objective is to say, okay, this is D&D, and you, and you have to come in, you have to play our way, and you have to make content the way we want the content made to be in here. They can't do that with the OGL. No way. There's just, it's not built for that. It's built to be open. What they're talking about is fundamentally closed. They want it to be a certain way. And if they're trying to do that, I don't think the community is going to tolerate it. I don't think the community is going to stay with D. They, if they make it so we don't have a choice about that license, I don't think that that's going to be a good thing. Hmm. Indeed. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious. I, I mean, me, I'm not a content publisher. I, I have published a few homebrew races on Reddit, you know, that people really like because they're adorable. Um, but like, I'm not I'm not really in that place of making money from, you know, 5e or any level or form of D&D content. But I think that me as a as a player, just looking at what they're doing, like I would be inclined to to switch over to Paizo simply because it doesn't feel good to do business with somebody. And I want, I, I'm sure that there are so many millions or at least thousands of people who feel the same way is that I, I, I think that I have such a bad taste in my mouth from the way that we just witnessed wizards of the coast treat their magic players and their D and D players. Uh, the, the, the level of just uncaring the, the fuck you pay me attitude that, I might just not want to do business with them or like, like I still love 5e. I'll still probably play 5e, but like, I'm not going to buy any new books. Like I, I don't want to do business with somebody who's okay. Treating people like right. that, like that's, well, and I think that that's what people are missing out on. Cause it's, it's all business in a lot of these guys heads, but they forget that morals and, and goodwill are really important to business. And if you act unethical, you know, you're going to lose business. And I think, but, I think that's the key difference too, between, right magic it's really hard to find another game that's close enough to magic to be like i'm playing the same game right right like you know flesh and blood's great it's a totally different gameplay experience than magic pokemon Absolutely. i don't like playing the pokemon battle pokemon trading card game as much but it's definitely a totally different experience from magic Yu-Gi-Oh, mm -hmm. totally different experience from magic I, yeah i don't even touch you -Oh. pathfinder <laughs> is mechanically different from D, &D but it is the role play that is the game, right? And the role play experience is going to be very similar between, I mean, Pi, one of the things Pathfinder does is they actually give more structure for role play, which I really like that. They, it's less, DD is very combat focused. The rules are very combat focused. Pathfinder gives you lots of extra tools beyond just your combat stuff. Like they do 10 minute, you know, like 10 minute blocks for out of combat activities where you can do, you know, it, it, divide your time into 10 minute slots and you can, Make skill checks based on what you're doing in this game. versus there's no real support system for that. Um, you came in and out a little bit up okay, here, yeah. Um, yeah, so the um, I think it's whenever my desk starts to mm. oh, we lost, oh, yeah, we lost, yeah, we yeah. lost you, yeah, yeah, I'm back now. Oh, you're back yeah. now, yeah, yeah. So I, I think the, the microphones, yeah, the I really need to get a, an arm for this microphone just. I would just buy you one of these Stabilize when it. I show up to your house for, for like our next D&D &D session or something. Maybe not the next one, because that's literally in less than 24 hours. But maybe the next, next one. 24 hours. But yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, the, the, uh, I think the thing about D&D &D versus Magic, right, is that Magic is kind of got the market cornered on trading card games in that there's no game that's exactly like Magic. And Magic has been going for so long. It's so complex now that it you really can't, have that level of complexity and depth with a newer game. And most of the comp most of the competitors of Magic are really new, right? Nobody's really been trying to fight Magic on their home turf, on their home turf, because again, Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh bring different aspects to the, to the trading card market than, than Magic does. Versus there are so many role-playing games out there now. I mean, I could think of 10 to 15 off the top of my head without looking at any lists of role-playing games that are out there that are not dependent on the D work, that are not dependent on Wizards at all. So if you really want to step away from D&D, &D, like, I could convert my campaign, and I've actually 
I looked into it. I could convert my campaign. We've been running for five years in fifth edition to Pathfinder second edition with very little headache. Like I could convert it over in a, like a weekend. Right. And I, I have a, for our, the campaign that we're about to start on Saturday, I, uh, the, so stoked. uh I have, I already have 56 pages written of new material for that campaign. That's going to come out. That's Compost, he's a writer. I see that look of, <laughs> of, of, of impressed on your face. I'm not, and, I'm not, ju- I'm not judging, Devin. And, and <clears throat> so I know I can, you're not judging. Uh, I'm, I, I am equally impressed. He, he is a... Uh, the, the DM. But I could... It, most of it's narrative, right? And I can move my narrative very freely between systems. All the, the biggest headache for me would just be converting all of the items and monsters over to the, the, the Pathfinder model from the, from the 5th edition model. But I think they're much more interconnected and, and inter- interchangeable than I think I realize I just need to dive into it. I'm waiting. I ordered a bunch of books from Paizo and I'm waiting for them to get delivered. I want to look into it and consider it because I've looked into the, like, just as an example of something Paizo, the Pathfinder does better than fifth edition, the action economy. Um, so in, in DD fifth edition, you have uh, uh, an action, a bonus action and movement on your turn in combat. You can, you can move your up to your full movement. You can use your main action, which is either an attack, a spell, like that. And then you can do a bonus action if you have something with your abilities. It allows you to do a bonus action. Pathfinder just gives you three actions. And you can use oh. spend them however you want. You can use an action to move. You can use an, but, Or you could use all three of your actions to do attacks. Or you could use all three of your actions to do spells. You, they don't limit you. Um, like one of, the, one of their combat actions is a scan action. So you can use your, one of your three actions to scan the combat environment for threats and things, and use like one perception roll to scan the whole environment as an action, rather cool. than have to do a, that as an action and then not be able to attack, or like to be able to sprint. Right in fifth edition, you have to sacrifice your attack to sprint. But I believe in Pathfinder, if you wanted to use two of your actions to be able to do that. Again, I'm not super well versed in Pathfinder yet. I'm working on it. But I love the idea of the action economy being a versatile po- versatile pool of you have three actions to play with and you, you don't have to be boxed into you must move or sacrifice your movement. Like you must That's move or lose your movement. You must, like essentially being boxed into having to use your movement, right? You either move or you don't move. But often in combat, when you're locked into close combat with a creature, you're not going to be moving for several turns. And so you're just giving up essentially one third of your available actions in combat. You're giving up your actions, whereas in Pathfinder, when you're locked in combat, you just essentially have a bonus action point you haven't used yet um, because you're not moving. I think it's very, very fascinating the way Pathfinder works. I'm really interested to see what these books look like and 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 whether or not we want to. I think what I would do first is try to develop a one shot in Pathfinder and see how we like it, and then discuss moving. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, gents, uh, we are we're coming up on that that one hour mark. Um, I know that last time we did like a almost three two hour, hour almost three hours, yeah, two and a half, yeah. Uh, but uh, I think version. that I think we've kind of covered everything. So I mean, you know, the the general outcome is, I mean, Watsi, regardless of their nice little gaslighty messages, they lost. The community won. They were kind of given a one four. And now we are just kind mm-hmm. of waiting to see what happens next, what they're going to do with one D and D slash sixth edition, whatever um, the, the fallout from that uh, what's going to happen with Paizo and this orc and, you know, project black flag. Um, and we will have to do a recap, but until then, I mean, I think that this is pretty good. I mean, do, do either of you have any just, you know, last minute comments or, or thoughts you'd like to share with, with the, the, the worldwide web. No, yeah, I don't think so. No? Okay. Yeah. Well, a um, couple last minute in, uh, announcements then. Uh, Nate, just just this this fellow right right there, yes. His birthday is in just like a hair over a week from now. So everybody uh, wish wish Nate a happy birthday uh, in the comments, or at least, you know, all 12 of my viewers. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, we're going to start our new D&D campaign. Make sure you guys check in next week. Um I, I, I don't know, but uh, Nate and Compost, thank you again to both of you guys for just like taking the time to, to chat this out with me, help me understand, deal with my talkative ass who cuts people off. I'm sorry, Compost. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, you know, let me let me say goodbye to the internet, and and I will uh, you know catch up with you guys in a second. Uh, if you guys don't mind. Just saying. Thank you again, friends. I'll see you in a Peace. minute here. All right, Internet. That is it. You, you've you heard it. Uh, I would say live, but this is pre-recorded. Uh, but thank you guys all just for coming back uh, and, and supporting the channel as you always have loyally over the last however many years I've been doing this. I'm growing my hair out. Look at that. You'll see me with an afro at some point. I'm very gray. Don't mention it. Um, make sure you guys check in next Saturday. I do have a couple other fun podcasts uh, being brewed up for you guys, uh, but we will uh, uh, you know, catch back up with, with this particular subject. Any of my D&D or Magic the Gathering fans out there, uh, you know, I wish you all well. I hope everything is going okay. Again, happy birthday to Nate. Please make sure that you follow the three of us on Instagram. Uh, Nate being, uh, oh God, at, at dragons underscore horde, at dragons horde on Instagram, and Compost being at dead end theory with an underscore between each word. Um, and, and feel free to just come and hit me up and talk about comics or anything. If you guys want to keep the conversation going, you can also join my Discord, the Collector's Room, which I forgot to shout out my last podcast, but feel free to hit the uh, hit that link I will put in the description that will help you join the Collector's Room to talk about all of your comic book, trading card, video game, VHS, movie poster, vinyls, and vintage toys, and, and, and everything else, all your, all your collectible needs. Okay, thank you guys. I will see you next Saturday.